FDR's method, one of his chief methods, was to bypass the media, which he attacked. The print media of his day was generally against him. He attacked the print media for printing fake news, misleading information. He would talk to reporters. He'd say, I like you guys, but I know you're told what to write. Right. So there was that kind of aspect, the parallel. And to get around that, we had Trump years ago went to Twitter. That's how he got his breakthrough. He was able to go around the media. FDR is able to go around the media through radio, uh, through his fireside chats, through basically uh, an expectation that if he had a speech to give, not only him, but other people around him, uh, they could they could give it. And they could break into existing network programming and so forth. So he is able to give his fireside chats, which are unfiltered, right? He just get, gives it directly. There's no press conference. There were no pre- well, there were press conferences, but they weren't they weren't uh, broadcast, right? They he had them, but you you know you don't have that kind of give and take with the press, and you especially don't have it with FDR in public unless it's very much stage managed. There was, uh, we've pulled a couple clips from his fireside chats. There's one that I want to play right now because you, since you brought it up, um, and it pertains specifically to FDR's suspicion of the media and in particular his concern that there was kind of, you know, anti FDR, anti New Deal propaganda being seated by foreign agents. And so that, that, that seemed to be a big aspect of his mm-hmm. suspicion of the media. Uh, Ian, could you roll the uh, fireside chat? One of the principal weapons of our enemies in the past has been their use of what is called the war of nerves. They have spread falsehood and terror. They have started fifth columns everywhere. They have duped the innocent. They have fomented suspicion and hate between neighbors. They have aided and abetted those people in other nations, including our own, whose words and deeds are advertised from Berlin and Tokyo as proof of our disunity. The greatest defense against all such propaganda, of course, is the common sense of the common people. So, I mean, your book just, it gave me a fascinating and kind of horrifying new understanding of FDR's complete dominance of radio. Uh, And part of that had to do with the way that he weaponized the FCC to ensure that dominance. Uh, But like when you imagine uh, from a 21st century vantage point, the the fireside chat, it's got this folksy kind of feel to it, a family sitting around the fireside listening to... FDR uh, kind of give them the new his take on the events of the day. Uh, but you point out that he was on 400 out of the 700 stations, basically blasting New Deal propaganda that was impossible to escape in an era when there were not a whole lot of other listening options. Could you tell me a little bit about the regulatory mechanisms that FDR harnessed to really dominate radio? Well, one one illustration before I answer that of the domination, the degree of do- domination, the print press, as I said, was mostly anti-FDR. By 1938, there is not a single anti-FDR commentator on network radio, which is where most people got their news at the time. Uh, I mean, if they listen to radio, that's where they listen to for the most part in terms of radio listening hours. So he completely dominates it. Now, if you look at the smaller independent stations, there is some leeway there. Even that is somewhat limited. Now, how does he control it? Well, it's 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 very complicated. Uh, for one thing, you have the FCC, originally called the Federal Radio Commission, and that was set up under Coolidge. And Hoover. Hoover was the big guy pushing that, but Hoover was inept in the use of radio. So FDR is able to use that. They have, for example, a rule. Uh, uh, I think the official rule is like two years, a license renewals, and they shorten it to like six months, right? So this is commented on repeatedly where, where stations were just in terror. They were on eggshells. 
And they were constantly going to the authorities. Is this all right? Or is this all right? Et cetera. Another thing is a kind of an equal time rule. It hadn't really developed in a kind of um, modern sense, but it was there. And it was, you know, showed up in court decisions and that kind of thing. It was an expectation that if you had, uh, say, you know, an alternative point of view, uh, you would uh, you would provide equal time. And this made uh, stations very skittish. There was a gr- uh, organization called the National Association of Broadcasters, and basically they worked in partnership with the with the FCC. And one thing that they prohibited was using stations as sort of personal voices. So if you had an Elon Musk in 1937 and he bought a radio station, he is not, and the FCC will back this up, he is not supposed to use that station to editorialize for his point of view. Certainly not if he does not give, uh, all, you know, equal time. But even, it's, it's just considered unseemly. Um, so you have the FCC. So the effect, I mean, the effect there, just to interject, is that no independent commentator can go on there and criticize FDR, the New Deal, but uh, he has the power of the microphone to go and say whatever he wants, whatever message he wants to broadcast to millions of Americans. Certainly, that is very much the case on network radio. Now, another thing is more behind the scenes more extra legal. And this would be very familiar to us who've read the the Twitter files. Uh, There was one anti-FDR radio commentator that was very popular. His name was Bo Carter. Carter had supported FDR, but he turned against him during the whole court packing thing in 1937 and became more and more critical. So how do they get him off the air? Well, they investigate his citizenship. He was Canadian born. They couldn't get him there. They look into his taxes. They really couldn't get him there. So finally, they had the bright idea. This was, I think, NBC. Let's go and exert pressure through advertisers. And a leading advertiser was, uh, you know, the, a company owned by Mar- Marjorie Merriweather Post, the original owner of Miralago, by the way. Um, and she uh, was, her husband was the Soviet ambassador, American ambassador of the Soviet Union, kind of a notorious figure. But in any case, she uh, they went to her. She was a leading Democratic donor, and they said, could you help us out? And she exerted pressure on the network, which was only too willing to, to help, to essentially say he's got to tone it down. Um, and he toned it down so much that he, he sort of lost his competitive edge, and he was he's basically forced off the air. Um, there were other stories like that. But Carter was was kind of the a, a key figure of someone who'd been at the top. He was on like three days a week on network radio. He was, you know, highly rated figure. Millions of people listened to him. One of the striking examples is this radio program, the American Family Robinson, uh, which seems like uh, it, it was kind of like a soap opera for the radio, but I guess had very strong free market, free enterprise views, which cut against what the New Deal was trying to accomplish. What happened to that program? Yeah. In fact, I've been thinking of writing an article about it for Reason Magazine because stuff's been written about it, but it, 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 frankly, I, I don't think it tells the whole story. Well, as I mentioned, there is some leeway for the smaller independent stations. And there, you know, there are hundreds of them, right? They don't dominate the airwaves like the networks do. But you have this uh, National Association of Manufacturers writes a radio soap opera called The American Family Robinson. And basically, it's an anti-New Deal soap opera. And they make transcriptions, these giant records, and they send them around to all these stations. And they say, uh, basically, here's some free content for you. Um, They try to kind of sell it as a public service kind of thing. 
to some extent, but it's a it's a pretty well done show. It's like a, a, a continuing story. It's got plot lines that don't necessarily have much to do with politics. But then it's you know, it's got this editor of a newspaper and he gives these anti has this anti New Deal commentator. And it's it's something that I always wondered if Ayn Rand might have listened to it, because if you listen to it at its height, it sounds a lot like something Rand would love. And it was picked up by a lot of these small independent stations. It's time to join the American family Robinson again in Centerville. Hey, you ever done any manufacturing? No, but I I probably could if I put my mind on it. Yeah, you could. Not in a million years. That's just the trouble. We got contact managers thinking they can build factories and professors running business and a pack of young smart aleck lawyers trying to run the whole government. There's only one thing those people can do to help business recovery. And that's the same thing a blacksmith would do if you took your watch to him to be repaired. He'd leave it alone. There never was a forced reform in this world that didn't end up in a deform. Do you actually mean you like the existing system? To have to work as hard as you do for the little you get, and at the same time have a class of idle rich going... Yeah, yeah, I know all about that. I've heard that gag about restoring recovery by soaking the rich, too. And it must be a gag... Nobody would seriously propose to restore life to business by knocking the daylights out of it. Well, what ha- ends up happening is there are complaints about the, the, this. This is uh, propaganda. And there's more and more pressure uh, put on these local stations. And the response of the people doing the show is basically to water it down. So it's very interesting. I've listened to the shows that are out there. And there are, I don't know, a couple dozen of them. Um, and if you listen to the early ones as wow, this is pretty hard hitting stuff. The later ones are these innocuous plot lines. It's like, what's your, what are you trying to do here? Right. What's your point? But it was a very popular show. Um, and it's, it's worth listening to if, if anyone, you know, you can just go online and listen to these shows. Um, and it's pretty high quality, frankly. Um, you know, they put some money into it and, uh, it, you know, some good writing. In fact, one of the writers. I always want to tell her story was a very good friend in Florida of Zora Neale Hurston. In fact, she saved, he was a libertarian, African-American, libertarian leaning African writer. She, Hurston's paper, Hurston was destitute, you know, when she died and her papers are being burned and this woman saved the papers and she was a good friend of her. So I always been interesting if those two sat around and talked politics. But she was the a writer one of the writers for this radio show back in the 30s. Yeah. I mean the striking thing about th- this sort of story and many others like it is the sort of indirect pressure that seemed to be applied. There was always a lot of stuff that seems to be happening behind the scenes um it, it's difficult at times to dr- to find the breadcrumbs leading directly to FDR, although sometimes they are there. Um, you brought up the Twitter files. This is kind of like there there is a kind of analog here where it's like we're trying now to grope our way through this question of like, when does the government cross the line from just having conversations with the tech companies to they're actually exerting a real tangible pressure or what we call jawbone we've come to call jawboning now um could you talk a little bit about the methods that fdr and his administration was using and that kind of indirect pressure well he would go to his secretary of the treasury but i mean this stuff wasn't necessarily recorded in official action he'd say look in this look into this guy's taxes. Somebody should look closely into this. And you had to be, if you were a critic of FDR, you had to be very careful in your taxes because uh, that was that was all often a threat. The reason we know about Bo Carter, the threat to, about his um, uh, citizenship and some other things is FDR let his hair down at a, you know, a retreat where he was talking to a very pro New Deal guy, big defender of the New Deal. I forgot what his name was, Uh, but this guy was appalled because FDR said, we have to find some way to get Bo Carter off the air. We're looking into this. We're doing investigations because he thought he could he could trust this. Another another guy he talked to was Raymond Moley, who was one of the key brains trusters. And Raymond Moley was complaining about some of the methods of one of FDR's allies, Senator Black. And FDR was like defending 
you know, these these really unseemly methods, probably because he thought he could trust him. There are occasionally um, uh, uh, we 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 have one interesting example of where we have the un, what I call the unfiltered FDR that everybody can listen to. In 1940, there was uh, FDR was running against Wendell Wilkie, and Wilkie was having an affair with a woman. By the way, would have been an Isabel Patterson's boss, who was the head of the edit, the head of the book section of the New York, oh God, what was it? New York Evening News, New York Post, whatever. Very influential figure, and he was having this affair, and Roosevelt was talking on tape because he taped some of his. He had a taping system in the White House. And by accident, the tapes picked him up with this conversation with one of his close advisors. And they said, we have to get this out about the affair. But how do we do it? So we can't have it connected to us. We got to release it to our people down the line. That's all I'm talking about. Not us. People down the line. And it's a, you can listen to it. It's, it's up online. Um, and uh, that is an example of the kinds of methods he was used behind the scenes, acting through third parties. Uh, and he's very slippery in that sense. And that's why I guess it's so easy to, uh, to not pay attention to it. I mean, you saw that you had that clip, but he doesn't say things like that a lot, right? They're that close. Even there, there's sort of, you know, some wiggle room. Hey, thanks for watching that clip from our show. Just asking questions. You can watch another clip here or the full episode here, and please subscribe to Reason's YouTube channel and the Just Asking Questions podcast feed for notifications when we post new episodes every Thursday.